there's a lot of change that's going to take place when you're implementing the Common Core Standards. And, and the first thing that we really think about changing is that content is changing. The content is um, shifting. Um, some of the content that we used to have in our grade level has shifted either up or down, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Another thing that's going to change is that our practices are going to change. The practice standards are definitely a priority, and they're causing shifts in how we behave as instructors. And then thirdly, our philosophy of mathematics and mathematics education is really changing. It's how we approach assessment and how we approach curriculum is definitely changing. So when we think about that, there are three kind of paths that we need to consider when we're looking at those changes. There's the curriculum pathway that's going to be changing. There's the uh, assessments are changing as we have PARC taking the place of the ISAT and the PSAE. And PARC is definitely um, a different experience than what we're looking at because it's much more um, looking at reasoning and concepts and it's a deeper kind of assessment than we are familiar with. And then we're looking at instruction changing in, to be in line with that kind of assessment then. Um, definitely it's impacted by the type of questions that Park is going to be asking. The way we instruct to get ready for that is going to be changing. So as we look at all of this change, we need to really think about that first big shift, I guess, of curriculum change. That, you know, curriculum is not a textbook. It is not, the, it is not defined by what is purchased. Curriculum is the path that we guide students on to learn these new standards. And there is not one right way to build that path, but there's definitely ways that are more productive than others. Um, just as an example, the model curriculum is probably one of the few curriculum structures that is completely based on the standards, and it really is designed to expose students to quantities and situations that build in complexity over time. And that's really what a curriculum should do, that it builds in complexity over time. Um, that said, there really aren't resources necessarily out there you know, that, that completely are aligned to the standards. Textbooks are resources. Programs are resources. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind as, I guess, educated consumers is that there is no textbook that is currently available that is built from the standards up and is completely aligned to the PARC assessment sequence. That is part of our challenge, that even though there are new products coming out, they, they don't necessarily match the PARC assessment sequence, the format of PARC, the level of complexity. And so we need to look at all of these resources as critical consumers. Um, there are definitely quality aspects and quality questions in textbooks, but I think we need to look at those and decide what resources would best help us to implement the path that we design for students. Um, and some districts are really looking at, you know, is that expense of purchasing new resources worth it? Because how much of the resource will you really buy? You know, we have to realize that the textbook publishers, it takes a while to put out a product that, that is uh, based on the standards. And the recent information that's been released from PARC, it's only been really recently released uh, within the past couple of years. It takes more than two years to put out a textbook product. So, I think that's part of our challenge is that the resources, it's not, you know, Common Core isn't necessarily something you buy. It's something that you're going to do. So keeping that in mind that, that the textbook doesn't define the curriculum. So I guess one of the key pieces to knowing if you are doing the Common Core is you are not completely dependent upon any number, you know, any particular resource. That you look at textbooks and you look at all the tools that are out there as ways of implementing your curriculum but you're not going to stick with any one product for everything. You know, going with that is probably the best mindset. There are three shifts that the Common Core writers came out and guided us to consider with these new standards. The first of those shifts is focus. Um, another one of the shifts is coherence. And the third is rigor. And I'm going to go in reverse order as we look at how do these look when we're implementing the Common Core standards. So first of all, rigor. You know, when we think about rigor, we, we, you know, we have to look at it as more than just harder problems or more, more challenging questions. But the way that we look at rigor is that it really is, is a balance of three aspects. And those aspects are conceptual understanding, procedural skill and fluency, and application. And the conceptual understanding really does support the other two aspects of rigor that students will do procedures 
with understanding if they have the concept first. And that they will use those procedures and the concepts in application of math to other math or of math to the real world. So that, that rigor is, is kind of a different definition than it may have been in the past, where rigor was getting to more complex questions or more complex numbers more quickly, um, that we would say we were upping the rigor. Or if we get more done in a, in a period of time, that we were more rigorous. And now we're really looking at that shift being a balance of these three aspects. Conceptual understanding is, is probably one of the most important ones to study because teaching conceptually really does take a lot of time. And I would say that that's where we're seeing the uh, textbook publishers that, that they, in the past, the textbook publishers have not focused as much on conceptual teaching, but it's been more about the procedures. So we're seeing shifts in the resources to being more conceptual in nature. Um, when we think about conceptual, we think about using multiple representations or multiple modes of representation. And when we look at those representations, we can see that the world can be represented with tools or manipulative models, with pictures, with written symbols. Um, if you think about any research that was done on working with special education students, you'd see this concrete representational abstract of methodology. That's really using manipulatives and pictures and, and then getting to the abstract symbols. But there's actually two more modes of representation that we need to consider. One of those is our language, and that, that vocabulary is a major aspect of implementing the new standards. And then uh, finally, and most importantly, is that connection to the real world, that that's truly what application looks like, is that you can take those concepts and procedures and use them in real world situations. Now having a concept of something means that it doesn't really matter which one of these modes comes at you, but that you can detect, oh, that's talking about a ratio, regardless of the representation. And when you truly have a concept of something, you can transfer between and among these representations that I could take a pictorial model and transfer it into symbols, or I can take um, my language or a real world situation I represent it with symbols or pictures or mini fields. So that's that deep conceptual look at things, that you have that, that it, you know it regardless of what mode comes at you. Now one of the misinterpretations of the Common Core is that students have to do things in all five ways. And I don't think that that is necessarily the case. We have preferred learning modes of representation. We have our, our learning preferences or our learning styles. So if someone is a really good symbolic student, you know, they may prefer to work with written symbols and not need to use pictures or, or um, tactile tools to get the right answer. But they should be able to interpret pictures or tactile tools if someone else uses those. And that, that's part of that, you know, deep concept that you may work with whichever mode you prefer, but you should be able to understand the other modes when you see them and you recognize that, oh, that's, like I said, that's a ratio regardless of what you see. I think oftentimes I see those Facebook posts or other things where someone is bashing the Common Core, and it's mainly because something has been misinterpreted that a student has to solve it, you know, the same question five different times or four different times using all the different representations, and that's not necessarily the case. We're really looking at that they have a way, that they have a strategy, and that they understand why that strategy works. That said, I think if you only have one mode of representation and you can't do it any other way, that your concept is a little bit more fragile. And so you want to be able to take any of these modes and be able to interpret what's being given to you. So that's, that's part of that conceptual teaching. I'm going to give you some examples from the model rec, um, curriculum with mo multiple representations. So if this is what it looks like in kindergarten, that they may be getting a visual dot pattern, transfer that into a five-frame representation, and then be able to represent that as an equation and use language to talk to their partners about it or color or other aspects. One of the other things about these multiple representations is that you can have more than one visual model and being able to, we don't want to be completely dependent upon the five-frame or the ten-frame, but that students can interpret it whether it's any other pictorial representation as well. Um, in another grade level, it might look like this, where this is fifth grade, looking at fractions, that they can take these different kinds of expressions and interpret them and see how that relates to the real world situation or the visual model. So if they don't know how to see the connection between these different representations, then their concept is not as strong. Um, here's an example from, um, this is eighth grade, looking at um, functions and, and linear 
um, linear models. So they may be able to take a table model and a graph model and equation and connect that to a real world situation. Um, or at the high school level, we've got quadratics, where again, we're looking at that representation between tables and graphs and in, in, interpreting those different models. So we see this repeated over and over again that students have these different multiple representations. Another key piece to conceptual understanding is the idea that there's more than one right answer to a situation. So here's an example from third grade, where we look at you know, which of these numbers, that idea of multiple select, that you can have more than one right answer to a particular situation. Or here's an example from, um, this is in Math 2 as well, this is looking at selecting all of the different quadratic functions that have the same vertex. So when we look at the standards and we dissect them, we, you know, here's an example of a conceptual expectation where we think about you know, what makes this conceptual really is this word understand. Understand that the three digits of a three-digit number represent amounts of hundreds, tens, and ones. When you see that clue word understand, it really is kind of leading you to that, that deeper conceptual kind of an expectation. Um, here's an example from eighth grade. Again, there's that clue word understand that a two-dimensional figure can be congruent to another and why it is congruent, not just say whether it's congruent or not, but actually be able to understand why it's something is congruent. Um, Here's another one from the high school standards where we're looking at, again, the cluster descriptor has that clue word of understanding. Understand solving equations as a process. It's not just that they should solve the equation, but that they understand the process of solving and that they need to be able to explain their reasoning. So when they explain each step in that process, they are showing their concept of being able to solve that problem as a process. And of course, being able to solve is the procedural expectation, which we're going to look at next. Um, one of the things about procedural skill influence is that we don't want to just look at procedures and just have them calculate without really thinking about the concept that they've got. So the art of critiquing is very heavily addressed in the standards. And we see that math practice um, being assessed quite heavily um, every grade level has got four questions minimally of, of critique or on explaining their reasoning. So that's that claim C or type 2 kind of questions is going to show up on the performance-based assessment. When we look at the ability to critique and say, do I know why something is right or wrong, that's going beyond just is it right or wrong. Um, another example of that procedural work is this level of engagement, that we don't want to just give them worksheet upon worksheet upon worksheet, but we want to do it in engaging ways where they have games or scavenger hunts where they get up and move and we look at that research on student involvement in activity and how important that is um, with these standards. Uh, looking at a procedural expectation, here's a third grade one, and we're talking about fluently, add and subtract within a thousand. That clue word of fluently really does cue you in that something is procedural in nature. Another clue word for procedural is looking at the word compute. Um, also, computing, computing. Uh, computing unit rates is the, is the act of really procedurally being able to tackle that, that concept. Another expectation we have is that, um, like in the high school standards, that we want them to be able to write and, and use tools and translate between forms. They, it, with a procedural expectation, they actually tell you which modes of representation you need to use. So they're giving you examples where where you know you may have to translate something from a graph to a table or from a table to a graph. That's a specific procedure, a specific process that we might want to work on. Um, when we think about the highest level of rigor, the, or the most challenging aspect of rigor, we talk, talk about application. And those are those claim D or type 3 kinds of items that we're going to see on the park assessment. Application expectations could be something like this, where in first grade, students are going to be asked to solve real world problems which have multiple parts. And this is a three part process. They might show their work using whatever process they want, but they can take this real world context and interpret it. Or in this case, this is a seventh grade task where they're not just solving word problems, but they're really thinking about the process of solving that it is multi-step. We see multi-step problems with whole numbers in fourth grade and with rational numbers in seventh grade where they really work up to the ability to solve 
a multi-step word problem. When they say multi-step, they mean more than two steps. So it's not just a simple two-step problem, which we might do uh, in the earlier grades, but we really are working on multi-step, you know, three or more steps to solve these problems. The other big thing about application is that it's heavily embedded in the real world. So we see applications of all these things that we used to do, but we bring it to that real world level where we're looking at a graph or we may use motion detectors to model these to understand how graphs represent our world. So we definitely want application to be embedded in real world connection. I want to pause for a moment. Uh, oh, actually, wait. Here's an application expectation where we look at, you know, we want them to solve word problems involving multiplicative comparison. Multiplicative comparison is a crucial concept of fourth grade, really lays that foundation for ratio work in sixth grade, and the ratios and proportionality is crucial for everything we do in middle and high school. So this one is kind of a key piece that they need to not only just understand what multiplicative comparison is, but be able to solve word problems involving multiplicative comparison. And they can use various tools to represent the problem, whether it be equations or drawings or manipulative tools. Another application expectation is when we think about eighth grade, when they're solving pairs of simultaneous linear equations, why else would we solve um, linear equations except in the context of trying to figure out where two situations might intersect or where they might meet. So that gets us at that whole solution process. So the solving of real world and mathematical problems, when we see those clue words, we can see that we're really leaning toward that modeling and application. Um, and then here's a high school one where we're looking at observing um, some functions in the context of the situation. So we might use graphs and tables, but we definitely want to look at how they represent the real world situations that they're supposed to be modeling. If you see the term model, we're really looking at that application. So we really want to dissect the standards to see, is it supposed to be conceptual in nature? Is it supposed to be more procedural or a combination of concepts and procedures? Is it supposed to be an you know, application aspect of rigor to make sure that our, our work and our assessments really meet the rigor of those expectations. So I do want to pause a moment and see, so far, do we have any questions about what I've talked about? I don't see any questions coming up. So if you have a question, you could um, raise your hand or, or put it in the questions bar. I could unmute you and you could ask. We'll give a minute, a little bit of wait time. Okay, then we are going to keep going. Right. That really gets at that rigor aspect of the shifts. We're going to talk about another one of those shifts, and I think the hardest shift is the shift of coherence. Um, probably because most of us are so focused on our own standards for our grade level or our course that we really don't have time to start analyzing what do they do before and after us to understand the coherent flow. And coherence really is not just looking at coherence within K8 or K5 when we look at the different series, but we really do want to see a flow that goes from K all the way on up through high school. Um, exactly. So when we start to analyze the standards, we really want to dissect to see, well, what do they do in the previous grade level to make sure that they're ready for our grade level standards? One of the biggest mistakes I see going on is that we focus on what we think our grade level is supposed to do, and we don't pay attention to what the previous grade or grades have done. And then we make the mistake of misinterpreting the rigor of the standards. So uh, just as an example, I've gone you know, to several high schools who are implementing um, the traditional sequence, and we're looking at the geometry course. And when I look at examples of what they're doing in geometry, they're really doing a lot of the 7th and 8th grade standards because they haven't gone and looked at what 7th and 8th grade expectations are. So when they talk about um, transformations in geometry, they're introduced to transformations in geometry in eighth grade. They learn what the transformations are. But in the high school geometry expectations, they're taking that geometry to that next level of really using transformations to prove congruence, to prove similarity, and not just to do the transformations and to understand what they are. It's really that justification and proof. And we're looking at a, you know, we even start that in eighth grade. But we don't just transform figures. At the high school level, we're going to be transforming functions, which helps us to see the interconnectedness of algebra and geometry. So we see all of this flowing together, 
and we realize how very critical it is to do that transformation work in eighth grade. Uh, I think that one of the best bits of advice I can give you is definitely get familiar with what the grade level or course below you is doing and make sure you're not just repeating their level of complexity. Because K-12 coherence means that it's not just doing what we did before. It is definitely building upon what we've done in the past. Another piece to coherence is that ability to pause and reflect. So the, the challenge in that is that we need kids to see what did we just learn and how does what we just learned relate to what we've done in the past. In the, probably the best country in the world that I've seen you know, looking at their curriculum for coherence is Finland. In Finland, it's actually in the design of the curriculum to pause and think, well, how did what I just do relate to what I did last week or last month or last year? So, you know, it's that key piece of understanding the, the connection in the build. And we don't want just teachers to see that coherence. We want students to see that coherence. Uh, another part of that thinking of coherence is looking at how ideas are built from one grade to the next, where in first grade, they're looking at place value and understanding you know, representations within 100 or 120 and tens and ones. And then when we move to the next grade level, they're looking at adding and subtracting you know, with those tens and ones and being able to represent those without counting on a 100 grid. And then in third grade, we look at fluent work within a 1,000, and we'd be able to prove and justify why an equation might be true or false. And then in fourth grade, we're going to look at fluency and really build that within a million, that they can add and subtract fluently to build up that expectation. We see that same kind of thing going on from math one to math two to math three, or from um, six to seven to eight, that we see this build. And so that's why it's so critical for us to know, what did you, they do last year? What do they do from one, you know, one year to the next? Another kind of coherence for us to really think about is the scope and sequence of a year. Now, interestingly, when you talk to people who write, who've written textbooks, oftentimes they've been assigned a topic to write a unit for. And they don't necessarily talk to the other writers about what they're doing in their unit. So you don't necessarily see a unit to unit coherence in every textbook. And that's kind of a critical piece that when we look at, this is um, an example from eighth grade in the model curriculum. It is truly important that we do Unit 3 before we get to Unit 4. Because in Unit 3, they're going to learn what similarity is. And that's a huge concept for us to have if we're going to use similar triangles to explain slope in Unit 4. You can't use similar triangles if you don't know what similarity is. That same kind of an idea happens in third grade, where we talk about using area models to understand multiplication. You can't use an area model if you don't know what area is. So the concept of area needs to be taught before they learn how to multiply and how to use an area model to understand multiplication. And another example here is this idea of using functions and doing functions before we solve linear systems, because we want to understand how those systems are made up of two functions. So again, there's, there's a method to the madness when we design a scope and sequence, and we do want to pay attention to that. We also, when we looked at the model curriculum, we also paid very close attention, and you'll see that this, you know, the PBA and EOI labels are on here. But we're going to look at what is being tested on the performance-based assessment versus what's being tested only on the end-of-year assessment. We want to make sure content that is tested on the performance-based assessment is actually addressed in time to use on the performance-based assessment. Um, so that's part of that coherence from unit to unit. The other thing we think about is the design of a coherent lesson. That each activity in a lesson, we don't want to just find activities that are cool to do. We want to think about how, again, that lesson leads into building in complexity. So you know, here's an example from fifth grade, where they're, they're learning on how to multiply fractions times whole numbers in fourth grade. So that's a pre-assessment to see are you truly ready to multiply fractions by fractions in fifth grade? First, we need to know, do you know how to multiply fractions by whole numbers from fourth grade? Then we look at using area models and visual models and number line models, and they learn how to represent those with different expressions and, and those cards that I showed before. They're going to even study the patterns and look for structure in this next segment, because after we've done that in segment two, we want to think about and reflect on how does, that, how does the structure of the equation and how the structure of the different models relate to the operations of multiplication. 
And then they're going to multiply fractions by decomposing into unit fractions. Again, analyzing that structure and thinking how we would mentally tackle this and why the algorithm works in the first place. And then take that into multiplying mixed numbers and what they're going to do. So there's a definite coherent build here where we look at multiplying fractions by whole numbers, fractions by fractions, fractions by mixed numbers, you know, getting to mixed numbers. Um, when we think about focus, focus is the final shift. Focus is the one that everybody's the most accepting of because it is, you know, saying we're going to take things off your plate and we're going to give you fewer topics, but we are doing them at greater depth. So most teachers are really excited about the idea of focus. But we don't want to just have focus content standards. We also really want to think about focus practice standards. You're not going to do all eight standards to the same level of complexity in every lesson or in even every part of a lesson. So we want to think about what do we really what practices do we really want to zero in on and how do those practices connect to the content standards that we're doing? That we see that pairing. Now, one of the tools we look at using the model curriculum are those evidence tables, or the evidence statements from PARC, where we, they've even given us kind of a hint of what practice standards and what content standards tie together. Or we look at the PARC model content frameworks, which gives us some examples of connections between content and practice. So we use those a lot. We use a lot of the PARC doc documents when we um, create the model curriculum. Another key piece to all this is thinking about how content and practice need to be blended as a unit perspective, where what does this particular content look like in each practice, or what does this particular practice look like within this unit of study. And I think that's my favorite box on our unit map, that it really gives an example of what does um, this content look like here, and what should I be observing in the classroom. I also really like this um, box to give to an evaluator when they're going to come into the classroom because they want them to know what what should it look like when they're observing in the classroom and which practice standards am I going to be zeroing in on in this portion of a lesson. Um, when we think about, here's another example for eighth grade, you know, we zero in on particular practices because in this particular unit we see those as being highlighted, as being highly emphasized. Or here's an example from the high school when we look at geometric modeling. Obviously, if the title of the unit is modeling, we're going to have the modeling with mathematics and see that four being a highlighted mathematical practice. But then what's it going to really look like? So I think that, that blending the content and the practice is a key piece. And those are the conversations that teachers are having. See, what should my classroom look like? Now, how does all this work look different? You know, how do you know if you're really implementing the Common Core Standards appropriately? One of those, the ways that we look at it, is this concept of justification. That we want them to be able to not just identify if a number is even or odd, but to prove it. And how would you prove it? And what are the strategies for proving it? So here's an example from, actually this is a third grade task that we're looking at bringing that concept from second grade. Can you prove if a number is even or odd? Because that's going to help us when we look at multiplication. Um, another example of justification, this is one um, from uh, fifth grade when we're comparing decimals. And we know why a decimal is greater than or less than another, because we are really looking at our language and our model to prove it and justify it. So you can see that this is a scaffolded task where as we move, we are giving less and less coaching as they're using the language to justify their comparisons. Or here's an example. Um, this is from Math 1, where we're thinking about, or Algebra 1, this would be appropriate. When you look at the scenario, they happen to um, be watching a movie clip or listening to something, um, and they're going to diagram the tension that they see in that, or the excitement, level of excitement in that video clip. And then they're going to write a paragraph to justify the graph, you know, explaining the rate of change at the key points in the movie. So how does the rate of change vary and, and how does that affect the graph? We want to justify that with our language and we want to, if we're going to make a graph or make a representation of a real world situation, how do you prove that your real world situation is being captured in this visual model? Um, here's an example of structure. Another thing we're looking at is that, that analysis of structure that I think this is a hard practice to teach because we're used to pointing out the structure to students and instead we want them to discover the structure to look for the structure on their own. I think that's very hard for kids because they have to analyze and discover things and sometimes we don't have the patience or the time to say to wait for them to discover that on their own, especially depending upon the length of our class period. You know, sometimes you just want to point it out and say, look, it's right over there, but that's us looking for structure, not them. Um, another example of structure is looking at the diagrams and how a diagram might represent a situation. Or, or This is an example from sixth grade when we're looking at 
division of fractions and whole numbers. Um, or looking at the graphs and the key features of a graph is helping us to understand the structure of a function and how it's represented in multiple ways. Uh, so all of this work with structure is going to lead us to be able to use that in this context of multi-step problems. This is another big shift we're going to see. That you know, here's an example of a multi-step problem from the fourth grade where they're really being able to work with whole numbers in a real-world context and think about it in a multi-step way. Or here's an example from um, seventh grade um, where they're looking at rate of change and interpreting that in a real-world context. This is not just a one-step problem. They have to think about what are all the different aspects to this before they can solve it and how would they represent that in a way that makes sense to them. Um, another key piece to this is this idea of modeling, that we really want students to be able to make models and interpret models and connect to the real world. So here's an example from third grade where modeling really is interconnecting these big ideas um, with how does the math represent our world and how does our world represent the math. Um, another example of modeling is uh, this is from sixth grade when we look at geometric modeling and you can see how that is going to build in complexity when we get to the high school and look at geometric modeling. Um, they're going to look at various um, three-dimensional figures and is I've been studying, you know, these the geometry standards at the high school level are far, far more intense than the geometry I studied when I was in high school um, because it really is all about real-world connection and interconnecting these big ideas. So how is the classroom going to look different? The classroom is definitely going to have far more dialogue, that we really want to see students and hear students grappling with ideas. So we don't just want teacher-student dialogue. We want student-student dialogue. And we may give them a few prompts to get them going, but we really are going for this idea that they start questioning each other. And that's where that, that critique of reasoning and justification are going to come into play. Um, it's also going to be looking at time, that we are going to spend more time on fewer problems. We're wanting to hear them grapple, and we're going to want to see all the different ways that they might approach a problem and let them have that time to interact with each other and agree or disagree on the methodologies that they use. Looking at things from multiple perspectives, looking at multiple solution pathways or even multiple solutions to a different situation. Another big thing about the classroom looking different is that we're going to hear less telling from the teacher and see more grappling. That we have the teacher being more of a facilitator and less of an imparter of knowledge. Um, I think this is a, you know, it is very challenging for us to, you know, think about our time period and the amount of work that we have to get done and give them the time to grapple. But we have to do that. We need to give them that time to explore and model and critique and argue, and that's, that's going to take more time, so that's why we have fewer problems. Okay, I'm going to put this one up here because I really want to give you a chance to look at a problem and think, and, and we'll talk about this one, and we're going to um, let you enter things in the chat or actually open up microphones to, to analyze this. As you look at this problem, um, I want you to think about what mathematical practices a student's going to be engaging in when they're tackling this particular task. And I don't see um, your your messages necessarily. So George, if you want to chime in yeah. what people oh. are typing in. Um, some people have typed in some questions. Okay. Uh, which, which I can, can share when the question session happens. I would also let people know there is on the left side uh, near the top of your interface, there should be like a little hand which would allow you to raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone and then you could respond directly to uh, 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 to Jenny. So if you, it should be on the left side of the little interface that you have for the webinar that there's a hand so that you click on that and you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you if you want to respond directly to uh, Jenny. 
Would you say Otherwise, I'm going to put George on the spot and say, what mathematical practice do, do you see a student doing when they're looking at this problem? Oh, well, okay. They'll all have to look at it. Um, uh, <laughs> going to rescue me, though, because I've been paying attention. Adam, what do you say? You raised your hand. Yeah, I mean, my first thought looking at it was um, just the structure component, just that students have to look at these four expressions and try and think about what each part of the expression means uh, in context of the word problem. So it's kind of the structure component of which part of the expression you know, has meaning that matches uh, the context and, and then trying to, you know, I think when they have to choose which is best, you know, I haven't solved it myself yet, but I think I would choose the one that, you know, the structure kind of best matches the, you know, the, the situation with the two girls here. Okay, and you're going to notice that this one says select all expressions that represent the sum of their heights. So this is one of those examples where there could be more than one right answer, which in fact there is. So this is for sure. Okay, any other practices? Anybody else want to chime in? Right. I think certainly persistence in solving, because you'd have to stick with this. Yes, you're going to have to make sense of the problem to see you're, if that's that you're going to have to hold it. And um, uh, Adam has something else to say, Adam. <laughs> I'll jump in again. I mean, just you have a, B and C both say explain why this is the best choice. You know, so, so there's a little bit of creating an argument there to say why it's the best choice. Um, you know, I think that would tie in as well, just some type of of reasoning as well as they're going to have to create that argument. Definitely, you hit on the two I wanted you to. So good job, Adam. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so. Now I want you to think about what does a classroom going to look like that's going to, let's say we're using this in the classroom. What should that classroom look like? Would you want each student working in isolation on this? Would you want students grappling with on this in partners and small groups? How might that look? Uh Yes, Kathleen? I think I, excuse me. I think I'd give them a couple minutes to read the problem, and as soon as I saw that everyone was writing, I would then ask them to get together and discuss what they were thinking. Yeah, I definitely think this is one where I would want them to grapple together. You know, you're not going to hear their arguments, and sometimes they don't know what where to start so when they tackle it with a friend or with a colleague they have a little bit more brave way of approaching a complex problem like this. So I definitely agree. I could see them, you know, reading it independently and then grappling with a friend. Okay. Another um, aspect to this one Adam is also that, had oh, some input on that and Kathleen was there more you wanted to say as well? No. Okay. Kathleen? I see your hand up, Kathleen. Was there more you wanted to add? Huh. I'm sorry, I was muted. I couldn't say anything. Not really. Oh. I think the two answers are the two on the uh, right. Okay. Okay. And then if you think about, um, is this the type of question that we're used to? Or is this kind of a different approach to analyzing an expression? Now notice that I think this, we, at no point do we ask them to solve this. We're just asking them to pick an expression and think about which expression would be best and why it would be best. And, and then think about the different situations because we've got one solution for Danielle's height and one solution for Elisa's height. So which one would be best in a particular situation? 
And I do think that we want them to start looking at, you know, there's more than one right way to do this, but there's sometimes a better way for a particular situation than another situation. So getting them to, to think strategically about how they write expressions and how they do things might help them to be better decision makers than just here's how to do it, where they think that there's one right way. Okay, so looking at, you know, once we've studied this problem, think about how does that reflect the standard as we look back at this standard. This, is, this was designed specifically to address 7EE2. Did we hit the mark? Well, one thing I think would come from working with this problem is that students would see that different equivalent expressions may focus attention on different relationships or different aspects of the problem. So do you feel that the task represents the standard well? I do. And and look at, looking at the standard, are there any clues in the standard that make you think that this might be a conceptual expectation, procedural, or application, or what, is, what do you think it's going for when we look at that rigor? That term, understand, is a, is a good clue. Yeah. So we want to look at this more deeply than just, hey, rewrite an expression. We want them to think about how does that expression reflect the situation which is a much deeper layer of understanding than we used to do when we thought about expressions. We would factor expressions and expand expressions, and we're still going to do that. But now we want to think about why are we doing it, and, is, and in one particular situation is it better to factor, and in another situation is it better to expand. So what's going to help us in that problem-solving situation? Okay. so. Um, George, you said that we had some questions, so let's pause. We do. Um, right away. Uh, one, two, three, four, five questions. Excellent. Um, uh, actually, I think more are coming in. So um, we'll start at the top here. Um, how do you know if students understand versus just being able to replicate a process with understand in all caps? I think that's a really good question. A lot of the time that comes from their explanations and whether or not they can represent it using a different mode of representation. Because if you can transfer from one mode of representation or from one you know, tool to another, you can see a deeper layer of understanding. There are a lot of kids who can you know, make a graph. But can they explain how that graph represents a situation or represents an equation or interweave the graph and, and analyze that graph? That's a lot deeper level of understanding than just making a graph. Um, and I think, you know, I, when I evaluate park items, I'm on the park um, core leadership group. And some of the conversations we often have are, you know, does the item truly reflect the standard and does it truly reflect the evidence statement? Where identifying a, a correct graph is, is, you know, simpler than being able to explain why that graph is correct. So the explanation and reasoning part really does get at the deeper level of understanding. The other thing I think that is a real, we've tried to incorporate this a lot in the model curriculum. In fact, it's kind of an edict from Jenny now that we must have critiquing tasks in every unit. Because when you have kids critique somebody else's work or somebody else's reasoning, they really delve more deeply into that understanding aspect than just this is how you do it, or this is where they went wrong. They have to explain why something is wrong or why something is right. And I think that sometimes it's harder to explain why something is right than it is to explain why something is wrong. Um, because a lot of kids know, well, that's how I would do it, so therefore they're right. Instead of thinking about, 
but why is that process effective in the first place? So that, that critique and justification, I think, is really going to get a deeper level of understanding, which is why the park is kind of a new level of assessment that we've never tackled before. Okay. Um, the next question is, how complete is the high school curriculum for the ISBE model curriculum? Well, there's actually a lot more that's been created than is up on the live binder. I will have to confess that. We have a lot of resources that are developed and uh, not up there. Um, they're, they're in the editing process. One of the things that the teams are doing this year is they're looking at things more from a unit perspective than just a model lesson. So they're not just um, you know, they've written model lessons before, but now that they're reflecting back on the unit, it's causing us to change a lot of the units, and that's true of all the grade levels, K through 12, that we're looking at it from what's the overall plan for the whole unit. We're making additional resources for all the different steps in that overall plan, especially the conceptual aspects and the application aspects, because the procedural parts, we feel like you probably have plenty of resources for those. Um, we may make procedural resources that are more engaging, like scavenger hunts, games, etc. But um, we try to make sure that we really address the conceptual gaps and the application gaps, that the, the resources just um, aren't out there. There aren't enough of them. So I would say that by the end of this year, the high school uh, will be just the same as everything else, that you'll have a plan for the entire unit, kind of a, a possible structure for all the lessons in the unit. You may not have every single resource you would need, but you would have a, an idea of what resources to plug in for those different steps, um, especially when it comes to procedural pieces that a textbook or um, a website or the, you know, that are available. Um, but our team members are doing a phenomenal job of creating resources that are both conceptual and application to plug those gaps. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Jenny mentioned how some high school geometry classes are addressing transformations at the 7th and 8th grade level. I was wondering, since CCH, CCSS wasn't grandfathered in, have you seen in your observations that many schools are struggling to teach the Common Core State Standards at the correct level only because the students just haven't had the foundation in that particular concept yet in a previous grade? Yes. Absolutely. You know, that's why in the model curriculum, one of the key pieces, again, an edict from Jenny, I guess, um, is the concept of designing pre-assessments to see, are they even ready for what we're about to do? Because the pre-assessments are for mainly prior content knowledge. We have two types of pre-assessments in the model curriculum. Well, um, we've got pre-assessments that look at, you know, are you ready for this seventh grade unit on ratios and proportional reasoning? Because have you got all of the sixth grade content down? Or do I have some gaps to fill with sixth grade? Um, and then the second kind of pre-assessment that we also have now is kind of a self-assessment pre-assessment for looking at enrichment purposes. Because we do have advanced learners that are ready to move at a faster pace. So we've, we're starting to um, incorporate more of these kinds of enrichment pre-assessments to see if they're ready. How ready are they? And is there content that I can compact because they have a lot of the necessary skills and concepts that I was about to teach them. So we really are looking at that pre-assessment to design better differentiated instruction. Um, and I think that's, that's crucial because we have a lot of gaps to fill. And even our most gifted learners, our, our advanced learners, have got gaps in content from previous grade levels. One of the other things that I think is so crucial for us to keep in mind is that none of this content is skippable. You're not going to go from fifth grade level math into seventh grade level math and skip the sixth grade content. You can compact it and go through it much more quickly because kids can pick up on things you know, at a rapid pace. But you don't want to completely skip a grade level's worth of content because it's not like the textbooks of old where the first half of the textbook may be a repeat of a previous grade level. So we, we can't skip content. We can merely compact it to accelerate students. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'll unmute people who ask the question just in case they want to follow up. But here's the next one. How do you, we really create the time for this when we have to prepare students for the park and incorporating the Common Core when they do not align? 
Well, the park and the common core are completely aligned. So I, I'm, I guess I'm not understanding the question. Okay. I think one of the problems that I've heard about here with the East Fed endorsement is once that once you have that, they have no problem giving you kids and then every single kid having an IEP. That's just came from having 18 IEPs out of 33 right? students okay. in my class. Okay, so you're looking at IEPs that don't necessarily align to the Common Core, um, which is definitely a challenge, and definitely IEPs need to. I think one of the key pieces is understanding what standards lead to what, and that's part of that coherence piece, where if I've got a kid who is supposed to be a seventh grader, and they're functioning at a level that they don't even understand operations on fractions or what a fraction is, and so they're at maybe a third grade level understanding of fractions, they're not going to be able to work with ratios and proportional reasoning at the same level of complexity as the rest of their So we need to think about what standards lead to what standards to walk them up that progression. And again, this is part of that color coding of the standards where we are going to have to prioritize to see what do those kids focus on. They should be focusing on the green content because otherwise they are not going to have those major concepts that are going to help them in life. Um, that said, what is green for us or yellow for us may be green for someone else. So here's an example. Um, sixth grade, they are supposed to be able to be coming into sixth grade fluent with adding, subtracting, multiplying fractions and only have to worry about dividing fractions by fractions. Uh, if a kid comes into sixth grade and doesn't know what a fraction is, they're going to have to understand the concept of a fraction, the models for representing fractions. They're going to have to learn how to um, partition and, and, and see how partitioning is represented in fractions, understand division of whole numbers and how they're related to fractions. Then they're going to have to understand how to operate on fractions, that the same kind of addition and subtraction um, structures that we use for whole numbers are going to work on fractions. They're going to have to look at how multiplication and division are interrelated to those, those same models. So it's going to have to be a process where they walk their way up that. And if they're not ready, we're going to have to meet them where they're at, which is that's the challenge, that this is a transitional time and not everybody's at the same place. Is that okay? All right. Um, so I think we have one last question. Um, these examples are great. The problem I'm having is understanding what exactly the type of questions I want my students to grapple with. I can or have made a few good ones on my own, but I find it frustrating when they're not question banks as resources for teachers. Are there any preferred resources that contain these types of questions that are available to teachers? Well, that's why we have an ISBE model curriculum team, and quite honestly, the team responds really, really well to your feedback. So um, we have reviewers who review our, our work from all over the state, and I would invite anyone who's on this webinar to join uh, as a reviewer. We send you out the documents. You have two weeks to review all of them, and then before we meet, you know, um, I, I ask you to submit your feedback on a Google Doc survey. I send that feedback to the team, and if you request and say, hey, we need more questions on this, they make those questions on that. That's what the power is of having Illinois teachers making resources for Illinois teachers. Um, they try to make sure that they um, represent a variety of contexts and connected to the real world and make sure it's park aligned. Um, we definitely look at all the park items and say, well, we need more multiple select items and we need more um, critiquing tasks and we need, you know, all of those types of things. So that's why we have a model curriculum team. Those folks meet, you know, they work for two, two to three days straight creating those resources that you request, because we know you don't have time to make all of that. That same questioner would like to know, how do I sign up as a reviewer? You just email me, <laughs> and I'll get you on there. Okay, and um, and will you say your uh, email? Sure, it's jwinters at lake.roe34.org. Uh, and I've unmuted in case that uh, that questioner has a, a, an oral follow-up, or is everything okay? He's good. All right. I think that is uh, the extent of our questions, and uh, no one has their hand up.
Okay, but I do want to um, give you just a kind of a heads up that, you know, the model curriculum team is basically the work of this team started from a, a, the state passing, the, actually the legislature passing a law that said we had, you know, that is we had to create a model curriculum. And it has expanded and grown because of the requests of educators from around the state. So the, if you want more things done from the model curriculum team and you want this project to keep going and expand, the best thing you can do is contact your legislators and contact um, your, you know, ISBE um, and tell them how much you, you want this project to continue because really ISBE has been phenomenal about supporting this project because the educators have asked for more. You know, it could have been done two years ago with here's the units and here's the scope and sequences, but you contacted ISBE and said, hey, we want more. So they expanded to K-5 and they expanded to model lessons and they've expanded to now all these different tasks with regard to the unit. So they are definitely listening to you and doing their best to comply with, with what you need. Um, I think it's a money saver and a time saver, and that's why ISBE is willing to invest the money and time in this team. In the future, that you know, the talk is that next year's work is going to be centered around professional development around the model curriculum, and that that's what um, we'd like to see happening. You know, trainings for teachers over the summer, possibly to get more teachers trained in the work that the model curriculum team does, and expanding the cadre of of um, facilitators. So, I just wanted to let you know that that's kind of where we're headed, and we'll everything is at the mercy of funding from our state. <laughs> so. That if you want things, you got to ask for it. Um, and I do want to summarize for you that you know if you really want to know how you how how do you know if you're doing the standards, you have to think about the fact that you personally, as a teacher, can analyze the rigor of a standard and know is this task mine? Is it appropriate for my standards? Is is the textbook publisher hitting the mark, or are they off base? Um, is it somebody else's grade level that's supposed to be doing this? You can also see that you know students should be more tired than the teacher. I think that you know the people who do the most work are the ones who do the most learning, and students should be working harder than you are. Um, you know you're doing it if you see the manipulatives and the other tools. They're out of the cabinets and into the hands of students, and the students are going and getting them, not the teacher handing them everything. You know you're doing it if you see that the students are talking more than their teachers are talking, and you might hear. Um, students explaining why they respectfully disagree with each other, or um, hearing them, you know, instead of saying, how do I do this, or how do I solve this, the teachers are asking, what strategies did you use to solve this, or could you use to solve this? And instead of hearing them say, when will I ever use this, the teachers are asking, when and how can this be used in the real world? So it's much more putting the, the onus of responsibility for learning on students. And finally, I think you know you're doing it if you feel like a different teacher than you've ever been before. Because I know that I did not teach this way when I was in the classroom. I thought I was a great teacher, and I am completely relearning everything that I used to do and thinking, oh, gosh, I really screwed up a lot of kids and released them into the wild. I wish I knew this back when I was in the classroom. I know I'm relearning high school math, completely different perspective than when I took high school math. So I think you're going to feel different, and then you know you're probably doing it right. Jenny, thank you so much for doing this for us, for being the initial presenter for the ICTM webinars. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we had 31 people sign up for this inaugural webinar, so I'm delighted that, that we have this turnout, and, or this level of interest. And um, thank you all for your questions and uh, for participating. And I think with that, we are are done so do send me here I'll send my email to the group if you have further questions that you um, would like uh, would like um, information about then um, feel free to email me let's see and um, uh, I intend to uh, uh, take the recording of this and put it up on the ICTM YouTube channel, as long as Jenny's okay with that. I hope so. Fine with me. Great. And um, so we will send out a notice to the membership through the listserv on when our next one is. Thanks again, Jenny. 
and thanks again to the participants. I'm going to stop the recording and end it now.